well, the market's eyes are in Delhi and all the meetings. The Reserve Bank and the Monetary Policy Committee could meet any time now. The scheduled date is August 7th, but in the last two occasions, the MPC has met at least two weeks earlier than the scheduled date. So this time, we have decided to invite CNBC TV18 Citizens Monetary Policy Committee also two weeks ahead of schedule. Joining me now are Chairman Pranab Sen and members of Citizens Monetary Policy Committee, Samidan Chakrabarti, Sajid Chenoy, Shaumya Kanti Ghosh and Sonal Verma. The MBC is meeting in a somber backdrop. Her GDP figures, estimates for the current year are ranging between minus 5 and minus 10 percent. And yet, inflation figures, which is what the MPC should be looking at, have been shockingly high. The last number, 6.09 percent in June. And in fact, they've been around the 6 percent mark, the CPI, that is uh, at about 6 percent for the last six months. So, Immediately, let me start with that question to you, Samiran. How seriously should the MPC look at the last inflation number and the last few inflation numbers? Uh, good morning, Lata. I think the issue is that if you look at an average CPI headline for the last nine months, that's 6.3%. So under normal circumstances, that should be worrying the MPC that uh, the hard-earned credibility of keeping inflation low over the entire term of the NPC, uh, in the last NPC should not be sacrificed now at the very end. Uh, but where we have significant uncertainty is that to what extent the last three months of headline inflation data can be trusted given the paucity of uh, different subcomponents of the data and the estimation methods used to arrive at the headline and the core inflation numbers. So if the MPC can take a leap of faith that this is not the true extent of the inflation and going forward, these numbers will be significantly revised down and the nine to 12 month ahead forecast will be significantly lower. Only then uh, they can consider the growth angle. Otherwise, my sense is that inflation should get much more uh, uh, weight in this policy, given that this is sustaining at a very high level for a long time. Sajid, though, what would your take be? Growth is still dire, even if inflation is at six. So can uh, the MPC look at things, uh, look at other ways to promote growth? Is an incremental, another 15, 25 basis going to make such a big difference? Yeah. Morning, Lata. I think you, you've laid out why the MPC goes into this meeting sitting on the horns of a dilemma. When you have both an adverse demand shock and an adverse supply shock, like the kind you see in COVID, we know for sure activity goes down. But which way prices and inflation goes depends on which of these shock dominates. So I think, uh, like Shamiran, I was surprised by both the breadth and the depth of the core inflation increase in June. April and May were estimated imputed numbers. June was a collected number. And if you look at June's inflation number, core inflation across the board surged. So I think ultimately the MPC has to make three judgments in my mind. One is, you know, they have to be looking forward, not looking backward. I completely agree that inflation has been above 6% for the last six months. But how, how good is the past a predictor of the future? So looking forward, they have to assess Will the demand shock offset the supply shock over the next three, six months? Will the demand destruction linger more than supply normalization, number one? Number two, if that is the case, and their six, nine month forecast does show there's some space for easing, you also have to make a judgment about whether to use that space now or use it in the future because the overnight rate's already at 3%. So there isn't infinite space over here. And maybe you want to preserve some ammunition for the future. And number three, uh, even if you believe monetary conditions should be easier, is it best served by just cutting overnight rates and adding liquidity? Or should they be more focused on transmission? I think the answer to these three questions will determine their action. My own sense is a sudden stop in the easing cycle may undermine some of the transmission achieved in the last three months and therefore maybe a modest rate cut just not to undermine that transmission, which also signals that space going forward is limited, maybe the right balance to achieve this time around. Okay. Uh, transmission, some tables will come up for you on how banks have transmitted. The bond markets have transmitted a lot, uh, but bank MCLR data will come up for you. Uh, but uh, Dr. Sen, uh, 
Uh, you know, the RBI governor, and I would think rightly so, has focused not just on growth, but also on financial stability. Uh, banks are in a dire strait. So uh, how should the uh, uh, RBI approach financial stability from the point of view of banks? Well, if you look at it strictly in terms of the point of view of the bank, um, in a sense, what you're saying is that the role of RBI as the regulator dominates its role as a macro policy maker. But if one, the problem that the banks are facing is that there's a huge amount of liquidity. There has been no real reduction in their uh, lending, their, uh, actually the cost of funds, because the process of uh, changing the deposit rates can only be forward looking. So the banks are in deep trouble. And in a situation where there is very little appetite for new loans, uh, the kind of liquidity that has gone in has left the banks extremely vulnerable. And uh, so at the moment, I think financial stability is of the highest importance because you don't want to come out of a situation where the supply shock has ameliorated the demand side is starting to pick up, but the financial sector simply lets the whole thing down. So I think this should be dominant in the minds, not just of the RBI, but as for the MPC as well, because it does have implications about uh, about the future uh, movement of uh, inflation. Ex yeah, exactly, sir. Uh, I mean, of course, the RBI and the MPC meet as monetary policy authorities. But uh, this banking piece becomes important uh, precisely for the things you say. Uh, do you think, therefore, the MPC has to debate restructuring? Look, it, it must. Because at the end of the day, the point that Sajid is making is valid. That, you know, you have both the demand and supply shock. And if you get into a situation where the demand constraint actually hits very strongly, then you are, you're going to find even those sectors which are demand constrained now going into supply constraint. So the focus really should be on the demand side. The RBI has limited ammunition in terms of what it can do because fixed capital investment is not going to happen. And as far as working capital is concerned, it's going to depend predominantly on demand. It's not going to depend that much on interest rates. So the RBI's ability to manipulate rates I think has, has, is no longer effective in the current scenario. The RBI will have to work with regulation, with trying to ensure financial stability and making sure that whatever necessary liquidity is provided. That's okay. all that RBI can do as of now. Okay. All right. So that's three people saying that a rate cut at this juncture is not going to be all that effective. Sonal, what camp would you be in? Uh, I mean, you were the first perhaps to say that it would be a minus 5%. I don't know what is your current GDP number. Uh, where would you be in the inflation growth uh, uh, camp and what should the how should the MPC address this dilemma? Hello, I think, uh, you know, the uh, growth inflation uh, dilemma, I think, has to be seen in the context of the over 100 basis point of rate cuts that have already been delivered. Uh, we know that you know monetary policy works with the long legs, uh, and uh, the other question is, you know, what is the effective lower bound in India? I think you know we clearly don't have unlimited space, so we should be preserving uh, some for the future if need be. Uh, so I think uh, in that context, even if inflation had not come in the picture, uh, there is ample reason for the MPC to wait and watch to assess, you know, the impact of the cuts that have already been delivered. Now, on inflation, I think clearly the April-May data is, has some signal, but also has a lot of noise. Uh, you know, from a forward-looking uh, perspective, uh, we are seeing, of course, higher inflationary pressures in food and in certain components. So it also makes sense from the inflation standpoint to just uh, assess, you know, how the inflationary side uh, pans out. So I think net-net, uh, this is actually more a time to stand pat. Uh, but uh, clearly, I think given the financial stability issues, uh, we are in a longer debt deleveraging cycle. Uh, and therefore, what the MPC should focus on this time is maybe more on forward guidance uh, 
to basically say that it's going to be lower for longer. Uh, so I think primarily forward guidance uh, and maybe certain tweaks on the uh, macro potential side, uh, like you're saying in terms of restructuring. Uh, but other than that, it's more of a status quo uh, at this stage. Okay. Well, uh, that is very important. Uh, uh, Soumya, the four uh, members of the MPC are almost giving me arguments that when they vote, I don't know what their vote is going to be, they may not vote for a rate cut. What are the other things the uh, MPC can do? Uh, or the RBI for that matter? Should it give some hint about OMO, about uh, uh, allowing banks uh, more leeway in held to maturity, not force them to mark to market? Any other instruments it should consider? Yeah, uh, thank you, Lata. Uh, now, I think the I agree with the points which has been made. I think the Sonal made a very valid point. I think the ultimate point is that initially we started with a significant supply shock, and then the supply shock has actually transmitted into a significant demand shock. So we are operating with two shocks: supply shock and demand shock, which had completely un made the recovery and the pros even the inflation trajectory uncertain. And the important point is that even in the current the data very carefully, I think the consumers have also started to significantly deleverage. In the months of April and May and also in the data which you were witnessing, there has been a fair bit of amount of deleveraging by the consumers. So therefore, a rate cut at this point may not be adequate in actually giving the signals of their pickup in demand. So I, And also the fact that there has been some shifting consumer habits in the last three to four months. Consumers are now not consuming services because that have disappeared from the market. Instead, they are using more of food products, cereal products, pulses, staple diet which actually is giving an artificial push to the CPA trajectory. So we need to wait and watch and see how these trajectories pan out and then take a decision. Meanwhile, to your second point, I think you are perfectly justified. The monetary policy committee, even though its mandate is to look into price stability and, of course, look into growth consideration, I think the time has now come to look beyond that and look more into these, I mean, measures which are, uh, I think, which are not traditional rate cuts, but which are basically monetary policy responses, which goes beyond them. For example, as you rightly said, I think the uh, need of the hour is that even the significant borrowing program and to incentivize the banks to continue to uh, uh, park their money in the investment, you need to incentivize them, for example, to hike the H10 limit. There is also a case for, for example, looking into the restructuring. There could all, because after the moratorium amends, I think it will be very difficult uh, to, to estimate and uh, project the path of NPA how it is going to happen. So there could be also some elements of a capital forbearance, maybe for a specified time period, the counter cyclical buffer, the capital adequacy ratio, even the macro potential risk weights, for example, looking at the risk weights on the consumer loans, whether the threshold uh, could be increased from the current level of five crores. So there are several policy responses which the central bank actually could look into right now. And it may be a very good idea to MPC to debate on that, even though a vote Voting on that may not be possible. Okay, I must say that you have uh, spoken up for the banks uh, very well. Uh, that uh, capital buffers, recapitalization, uh, uh, all these uh, could also um, risk weight of uh, specific sectors can also be juggled. But you know, every time you give a moratorium or a restructuring, the money that is due to banks is not going to come, and yet they have to give loans. There is also an all-pervading risk aversion, which is natural. How can the MPC reduce or address this? Those questions remain. And also, Indonesia has shown us the path of direct monetization. Should the MPC and the RBI debate on that? Those questions to the MPC members in a minute after this break. Back to the deliberations of uh, the CNBC TV 18 Citizens Monetary Policy Committee. We have with us Chairman Pranab Sen and members Sonal Verma, Shaumi Kandikosh, Sajid Chinoy, and Samiran Chakrabarti. Uh, Dr. Sen, let me start with you. Uh, the position of banks is bad because if you do a moratorium, they don't have incomes, but uh, they have to continue to uh, uh, provide loans. At the same time, at the moment, whatever excess uh, money they have fetches them all of 3.35% at the reverse repo window. Cost of money, cost of deposits is higher. How should the MPC or the RBI address all this? Well, Rafa, the point is that in the last policy, the reduction 
that was made, especially to the reverse report, uh, was that under, was under the impression that the uh, lockdowns would be eased within a couple of months, and and therefore the uh, the banks should be encouraged to do more lending. But what we've seen is, number one, the lockdown has been extended significantly longer and will continue to do so in bits and pieces across the country. Uh, as a result, the appetite for taking loans is very low at the moment. Uh, some of it will happen, but a lot of it will, will not. So the, you have the banks which are really carrying the can now. So they've got a huge amount of liquidity. They've got large liabilities. And their, uh, their portfolio simply isn't giving them adequate return because too much of it is tied up in the reverse repo window. Um, in a situation like that, the question is, how does one uh, help the banks to survive until credit demand picks up? As you rightly said, the deleveraging is already happening across the board. Everybody's trying. Now, if that happens, the ability of the banks to bounce back uh, is going to be limited. And my personal belief is that we need to start now before things become so bad that a huge amount of recapitalization becomes essential. Oh, well, actually, uh, even on uh, restructuring, we already heard the SBI chairman, and he said, no, we should not allow another moratorium. It should be left to the discretion of the banks. What would your thoughts be? How, how should restructuring, if it comes, and you told us uh, just a while ago that it should come, how should it be nuanced? Well, you see, the, the thing is, the moratorium um, was something that was given uh, on the discretion of the banks. And different banks have given moratorium at different levels. Some have given a very high percentage of their outstanding moratorium, others have not. So a lot of the weeding out that had to be or could be done has already happened. You know, firms which are not granted the moratorium uh, what have probably already been identified as losers. The point is that the restructuring is a recognition that the pain faced by the borrower is going to be extended quite significantly. So what you're doing is trying to tailor man make his liabilities to match what you expect from his revenue flows. So to my mind, whatever are the standard assets that banks have at the moment, I think the restructuring should be done across the board. If you're going to allow banks to do pick and choose at this stage, they may actually make egregious efforts. Okay, so mandatory restructuring almost is what yes. uh, you're uh, uh, speaking of about. Of their currently standard assets. Of their current standard assets, of course. Uh, yes, not the NPAs. Uh, Sonal, you know, if uh, uh, what can the uh, RBI do uh, in terms of helping the government? I mean, Indonesia, and since you're in Singapore, you're closer to that uh, situation, has shown the path of direct monetization. Should that be debated and hinted, or even uh, uh, announced directly by RBI or MPC? Lata, I mean, if you uh, look at the uh, Indonesia example, um, policymakers there, both Bank Indonesia and the finance ministry, have gone out of the debate to try to convince investors that this burden sharing is actually one off um, because of the unprecedented circumstances. Uh, but the reaction in the currency market actually has been negative. Uh, so, um, you know, foreign investors are still not coming back to invest in uh, Indonesia. So, I think, uh, you know, whether we can learn something from uh, Indonesia, I would say at least the market reaction suggests that investors uh, will be skeptical even if policymakers say that this is uh, one-off. Uh, particularly for India, I think the question is, uh, I think in general, uh, you know, the markets have been able to, despite all the worries, uh, at a certain price, have been able to absorb the higher supply. And that is because precisely, you know, bank lending is weak because growth is weak, so the extra deposits are getting into the risk-free SLR uh, security. So even to the question of whether it is necessary, I don't see yields being substantially higher. Now, if that were the case that, you know, market volatility rises too much because of supply 
buy side pressures, then uh, yes, the Reserve Bank of India should step in. Uh, but uh, I think, uh, you know, the example from Indonesia, I would not apply necessarily to India. Uh, I think, you know, the open market operations calendar via secondary market uh, intervention uh, should continue to be the, uh, at least the first line of uh, defense. Okay. Well, MPC deliberations are not only meant for fresh ideas, but also to kill what may not be a good idea. Uh, and, uh, Samira, I wanted to ask you even about liquidity. I mean, a lot has been uh, put on the table. Four months, we have had six to seven lakh crore of excess liquidity in the system. Our previous experiences have been very negative. 2009, we had we allowed excess liquidity for about uh, a year, and we harvested uh, uh, you know unfortunate infrastructure loans. 2017, excess liquidity, NBFC bubble. Is it time to take stock as to whether we should allow so much liquidity for so long or uh, should it remain? I mean, uh, we still, we are in a very soft growth environment. I understand that there are some inflationary pressures which are emerging, which is making this growth inflation uh, debate a more uh, difficult one. Uh, but having said that, it will be tough for the RBI right now to uh, take out this excess liquidity from the system. Uh, the challenge more is going to be as we go into the second half of the year, uh, this excess liquidity might actually increase because RBI will have to do uh, more of OMOs, uh, maybe even more of FX intervention if the trade account remains in surplus and we uh, start seeing more BOP surplus. So uh, from that perspective, uh, we think that uh, the liquidity surplus is only going to expand as we move forward. The whole question is that at what point of time uh, would RBI uh, start thinking about withdrawing it and what kind of benchmarks are to be used for that? My personal view is that uh, we have to go beyond the traditional growth and inflation markers to judge that. We have to look at asset prices very, very closely uh, okay. to understand whether uh, there is the right time uh, to start winding down uh, this excess surplus or not. And thankfully for us, the currency in circulation temporarily has gone up significantly, which has reduced the surplus to some extent. Okay. Uh, whether this trend continues beyond a point is also something that needs to be seen. One thing is very clear that banks lending out this money is not going to take out the liquidity surplus from the banking system, mm. which is a completely uh, uh, mistaken view yeah. in the markets. Yeah. Uh, the banks can give as much credit as they want yes. out of this the liquidity will still be in the system yes. because this liquidity is created by RBI and RBI is the only person who can take out this liquidity. Yeah, absolutely. We don't uh, uh, normally realize that every loan creates a deposit. So uh, the way to reduce the liquidity is not by giving more loans. Uh, that's a, a fallacious understanding. Actually, we are completely out of time. So uh, Sajid and Soumya, I'm going to give you all a minute each to t discuss what we have not yet discussed. Growth is in dire straits. Sajid, what can the MPC and RBI do? Well, uh, a couple of things. One is, as I said, what you don't want to do is undermine the transmission previously achieved. We've seen a fair amount of transmission in bond markets. Even there, I would say it's the high-quality bonds that have that have rallied more. A double-A bond still haven't, the, the slope of that curve is still pretty much the same as it was in March. But the real issue, I think, Lata, is in the banking system. Uh, you know, we've had almost 180 basis points of overnight uh, cuts. And yet, if you look at public sector weighted average lending rates over the last three months, it's only been 45 basis points. Points, right? So I think what we really need is to create an ecosystem where you're getting transmission of the previous rate cuts. What does that mean? In my view, that would mean some kind of one-time restructuring so the NPA burden uh, you know, doesn't become uh, too overbearing. Uh, recapitalizing public sector banks uh, preemptively, both for resolution and growth capital. And I think the next move is not focusing on system liquidity, but to focus to try and ensure that that system liquidity through regulatory measures is reaching the peripheral parts of the financial system, which were critical in, in generating credit growth over the last three or four years. So I think this is now moving away from a story of overnight rate cuts and system liquidity to how we can get more transmission at the peripheral part the financial system and most of all in lending rates. Okay, I, I'm not still sure how RBI can achieve that other than providing, uh, making it a disincentive to keep uh, liquid cash. Uh, Shomyo, any other point you want to add? 
No, I think uh, I agree with most of the uh, points which are made by the panelists. I think it, right now the time is for unconventional monetary policy measures because conventional rate cuts, and I, I also tend to disagree a little bit with the fact that the transmission is not happening because right now we have a system of external benchmarking where the entire transmission takes place at one go. So it may be better to look into some other data points like how the external benchmark numbers have gone and that, for example, for our bank, the number is right now below 7%. So the issue is of stability adequate demand so while we should do the unconventional monetary policy responses as we said as said at the beginning but we should be very careful because that should be done within the limited time frame and a limited incentivization for the banks so that once the growth comes back maybe maybe for a quarter or two quarters once the growth comes back we don't have a system we, we don't have an uh, uh, NP over and within the banking system because that's going to be the crucial issue in the second half of the current fiscal, assuming that this we, we lead through this pandemic crisis by August or September. Okay. I know we could have gone on, but out of time, gentlemen, please start your vote and please write it quickly. Uh, uh, first vote, of course, is what should the MPC do in the upcoming policy? Uh, is it a cut? Uh, by how much or a pause? Uh, can we start voting, uh, Samiran? Okay, pause. Uh, Dr. Sen? Okay, that's a pause. I should have got to the chairman last. Uh, Sonal? Pause. Pause. Uh, Sajid? Oh, a 15, 15 to 25. 25. A minor cut. Okay, 15 to 25. Shomyo? Pause. Okay, the pause have it. You are not going to likely get a rate cut this time if this is the MPC. Okay, do you expect cuts hereafter? What should be the terminal repo rate be? At the moment, it is four. Samir, and watch how many more cuts can we expect the terminal rate to be? Uh, three and a half. Fifty basis cuts left, though not in the August policy. Doctor Sen, how many more rate cuts? At the moment, I would say all at four. Okay. And later, again, okay. this should be should be a decision which we should not try and force on them now. Okay. Uh, so later, we really need to revisit the okay. number. But I would go with three and a half percent as okay. well. Okay. Okay. It can go to three and a half. So he, uh, yeah. Dr. Sen also expects another 50 basis cut, but not in August. Sonal? Uh, yes, yeah, similar. 50 basis cuts. 50 basis cuts more left. Sajid, how much more left? Including in August. Yeah. Okay, 3.75. One quarter percent is all Sajid expects. Shomyo. I'm expecting 50 to 75, but mostly oh, 50. 50 to 75. So the terminal rate could be three quarter. Okay, fine. Thank you very much, uh, members of the Monetary Policy Committee. The big takeaway, uh, most of them are not wanting a rate cut now, but they do expect a 50 basis later. Restructuring is the way to go, but it should be nuanced. Dr. Sen believes it should be mandatory, not left to the discretion. Otherwise, banks may not pass it on. Thank you very much for the deliberations, uh, uh, members of the Monetary Policy Committee.